Hallo, welkom allemaal. Fantastisch dat er zoveel mensen zijn gekomen vanavond naar de, de Public Art Space, All is Giving, in onze tentoonstelling. En in het bijzonder uh, onze gastspreker vanavond, uh, Michael Paraskos. Ik ga nu verder in het Engels, want uh, Michael is onze gast. Michael, welkom in All is Giving. I will start with the phrase that every time, every period of culture has the right of its own culture and doesn't need to chew on the bones of the past. And that's why we invited Michael uh, this evening, not because we need an extra program on the All is Giving show or we need some intellectual knowledge behind this show, but we invited Michael Because Michael's ideas, you know, when he wrote the book, this book, Regeneration, you know, you all should read it. It's a really interesting book, a personal book. Because that book, you know, and the thoughts which are in that book, how Michael has written that, are in the heart of this show, which I made together with uh, Esther de Graaf and Nadia and Lisa Lot. So it's not just that we need some extra words or some things to say about the show or to fill up some emptiness. No, Michael is really a contribution to the ideas and to the things we want to provoke with this show. It's a public art space, but it's also the way we build it and the way we organized it. We want it to be an inclusive space. And that's also something Michael, in different words, from different perspectives, is telling us tonight. He has a very interesting speech. It will take something longer than an hour, but it's worth his listening. Um, to introduce Michael, um, what I said already, he wrote this book, which I got to know in 2007, and uh, my gallery owner, then Annette de Keizer, gave me a copy um, of this book, and I read it. And I recognized so much in what he said and how he discovered what is going on in the art world today that I was so happy and so pleased by what I read there that I gave it immediately to a couple of my friends to read this book and to tell me what they thought about it. So I recognized a lot of myself and my own ideas in this book about where the art world was in 2007 and is still going in the wrong way. So, Michael is from London and from Cyprus. He's a writer and a philosopher, and he teaches in uh, Cyprus on an art school there. And um, he wrote this book, Regeneration. And next year, S. Gates Publishers in New York, they will um, publish a new book he wrote on Herbert Reed. The program tonight is that Michael will give his talk, and then afterwards uh, there will be no answer and question session um, because all what Michael wants to do is raise questions, not give answers. But of course Michael will stay here, and so if you have questions, you know, and if those questions are a, lo a lot of people, among a lot of people, we can still do a kind of question and answer. But first of all he will do the talk and then we will have a break. And then you can come up to him, and if he finds that some things are really worth talking longer about, we will kind of like make an audience again. That's all I have to say. So, let's welcome Michael Paraskos. <laughs> Goodness me, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Ad. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. It's, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not often I get audiences as big as this to, um, to talk about these ideas. Um, uh, that may be a good thing, because uh, as I was explaining to the students yesterday at the Minerva Academy, um, sometimes the ideas do provoke quite a, an extreme reaction. Um, with uh, one early version of this paper 
uh, resulting in a, a very angry artist in London threatening to throw me out of a second, wall, fl second floor window. So, uh, you know, maybe, maybe having a lot of people here means I won't be able to make it to the exit in time. But having said that, I, um, I'm always slightly, slightly baffled um, when things I write reach any audience. When you're a writer, and I know there are many writers, several writers anyway, in the audience, and many of you will experience this as visual artists as well. It can be quite a lonely experience. You don't often get uh, feedback. Um, and unfortunately, the nature of feedback is usually negative. People don't usually write to praise you. They only seem to pick up a pen or run nowadays an email um, to abuse you. And, and so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm always a little bit... I, I, I actually confused, you know. I, don't, I, I genuinely was amazed that Ad and, and, and his team here had even heard of me, you know, let alone would want me to come and speak. So, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, to Ad and to Esther, Nadia uh, and Lisa Lott and, and everybody here um, and at the Minerva Academy and generally in, 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 in uh, the Netherlands for, for a very warm reception that I've had. That may all change in the course of this court talk, of course. <laughs> Um, I, I used to say this as part of the culture of coming from the Middle East, or half of me coming from the Middle East, but maybe it's not, maybe it's something that's unique or strange to me. Um, I tend to talk in stories and parables, and you'll notice a few of them in there, but some of them are drawn from my, my own experiences, some of them just sort of come, I don't know where from. Um, there's a few in Regeneration as well, and Regeneration really started as a book that was um, not intended for publication. It was a private document, um, part therapy, I suppose, part healing, um, but also it was a private document between me and a very small group of friends, so I would just write things and send it off to them, and it was their idea to publish it. Um, and if you read it, I mean, there are some very personal things about my life in there, uh, which any sane person would probably not want made public. Um, but, you know, it sort of creates a narrative which I, I suppose, you know, and, and you know, people have told me this elsewhere, people do seem to respond to for some reason. Um, so I'll start with a, a little story now, which is really what happened to me at the beginning of the week. Um, all of this was arranged long after I'd booked a trip from London to Cyprus to go and do some teaching there. So I had my original ticket back from Cyprus to London, and I had to get a new one, which I don't mind. I mean, that, that's fine. That's, that's, that's not a problem. But unfortunately, it's the English, or it was the English school holidays last week, um, and so I couldn't get a ticket. And that meant I had to travel through Turkey uh, from Cyprus, from Greek Cyprus, to get back. Now, if you're a Greek Cypriot, or even half a Greek Cypriot like me, that's quite a nerve-wracking experience. As you might know from the history of Cyprus and Turkey, um, it's not always smooth. Turkey is trying to get into the European Union now, and it's being blocked by Cyprus, uh, amongst other countries. Um, and so, although we can visit Turkey, and we can visit the occupied territories in Cyprus, it's a slightly unnerving experience for many of us. Um, and that experience or that nervousness um, is manifest in strange ways. You see a Turkish flag and, you know, there's no logic behind it and, you know, it's not, um, it's, you know, it's, not, it's genuinely not racism and it's not, not um, hostility. But you see a Turkish flag and you, your heart misses a beat because you are a little bit scared if you're a Greek Cypriot, and I'm sure Turkish Cypriots would say the same when they see a Greek flag, but I don't know. So I was traveling through, and of course, when you're traveling through airports, you, you come up against security, um, airport security and police, and people wielding machine guns hanging around airports, hopefully the security guards and not other people. And it makes you a bit worried. And so... I was a little bit on edge, because I'd never really done it this route before. 
And I got through the security, and nothing was a problem. Everyone was very nice to me. You know, they said, you know, hello, welcome, you know, through. They were obviously amazed that anybody from Greek Cyprus would go that route. Um, I thought, okay, this is, this is all right, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. And I went up to the coffee shop called Gloria Jeans, which I think is an American chain. And I ordered a coffee. And the immediate thing the coffee man said, or the barista said, was, what is your name? And I tell you, I shat myself. I couldn't believe <laughs> what was going on. Had they found out that I was a Greek Cypriot where I shouldn't be, in the middle of a Turkish Cypriot or a Turkish airport. And so I panicked. I said, well, well, why do you want my name? Why do you, what's it? So, oh, we write people's names on the coffee cups. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the moral of that story, I suppose, is one shouldn't judge things by one's preconceptions. And in some ways, I suppose that's something that this trip here is very clearly teaching me. Uh, my conception of my position in the art world, and I, I do think I have a position in the art world, whatever that means, but I, I seem to engage with the art world, is that nobody is interested, that the ideas go out there and they disappear into the ether. I'm aware that people are slowly buying the books and things, and for some reason in Chicago there's a little bit of interest because uh, it, it's, it's on the syllabus of one of the art schools there. Um, but I never really had any sense that um, there would be any interest, enthusiasm, you know, certainly not to bring me over to talk about the ideas. And so, you know, it, it, is, it is incredibly you know, humbling in a sort of way. And I, I, am, I am very grateful, as I say, to uh, all of you for coming. Even if you don't like what I'm going to say, even if you think it's a load of nonsense, um, even if you think... Um, I suppose it's hostile, but I mean, it's not intended to be hostile. It's, it's intended as provocative, intended to provoke a debate, a discussion, questions, as I had rightly said. There is a book that preceded, I think, I may be wrong in the order, but um, I think it preceded um, Regeneration, called The Aphorisms of Ursi, which, which is over there somewhere, or was over there somewhere which um, came out of a teaching session, or a week-long teaching session that uh, uh, I and Clive Head, a friend of mine who I collaborate with quite closely, um, took part in, or led, in southern Germany, in the village of Ursi, um, where the Swabian University um, of Bavaria has um, uh, a, a sort of conference and, and teaching centre. And uh, this was called the Kunstleben, um, and it was a mixture of art students, professional artists, and amateur artists coming together to do workshops, um, similar to what's happened uh, at the, uh, the Minerva Institute, uh, the Minerva Academy this week. It was a very strange experience for us because we do not speak German and almost none of the participants spoke English. And I suppose in some respects that, that's a testament to the power of art. You can actually teach art, talk about art, I suppose, to people who don't share your language. You can do it through demonstration, through uh, leading by example and things like that. So it's, it's a sort of proof that it is a non-verbal language in a sense. But because we were not involved in the sort of social life fully, um, we start, had each other to talk to. That was, that was, it was quite a long period just to have each other talking to, to talk to for, you know, 12, 18 hours a day, whatever it is. And out of that came these statements, the 75 of them all together, some of which are deliberately jokey, some of which are deadly serious, but we don't tell you which are which. But I'll give you a clue. It starts with the serious and it ends with the joke. And you can make up your own mind for what's in the middle. I'll give you the end statement, which is, and uh, you know, I do apologize to any Swiss people who may be in the audience, 
beware the Swiss bearing sausages, um, which is a nonsense statement, a sort of almost Dada statement, appropriate for Switzerland, I suppose, um, uh, which came about because uh, uh, there was a, a Swiss art dealer who kept taking us out to dinner and in, trying to force us to eat these disgusting sausages. <laughs> disgusting even for my friend who's a meat eater, and I'm a vegetarian, so it's doubly disgusting for me. Yeah. <laughs> but... The book begins with a statement that I think is deadly serious, that art is always definitive but never dogmatic. In other words, as far as we were concerned, the artist and the art critic always means it. Irony is a real problem in art. Jokes, humor, goodwill, all of that can happily exist with art. Irony is a slight problem, I think. It's a sort of falsehood, and I'm not sure art can ever be false, deliberately false. So the artist is definitive, we were suggesting, but never dogmatic. In other words, never failing, or never unwilling to engage with new ideas, new situations, new people, which is what's happened for me here. And coming here, and meeting Ad and his team and, and, and other people here has changed some of my thinking. What Ad asked me to do was to come here and start a revolution. Now, <laughs> I'm not sure how you do that. Um, maybe, maybe it will happen, maybe it will not. So all I can do is come here and talk about some ideas, but I always have in, that, in my mind with that, really, the notion that art is always definitive but never dogmatic. Art criticism is, in some sense, definitive but ne never dogmatic. And so I changed my talk. I mean, I was even working on it this morning, because it's an organic thing. It's not a dogmatic statement. And in changing the talk, the first thing I changed was something to do with um, an artist, a German artist I, I met in Wales called Angelina Schuber. So if we have the first slide, I, I think. The next slide, sorry, I need to go back to that. <laughs> Angelina Schuber. Angelina Schuber. Who I think is an interesting artist, but I think what discussing... Uh, Angelina's work with Ad and others, and, and thinking about it myself, I, I sort of realized that, that maybe it doesn't fit in with the discourse, with the narrative, and I just have to be honest with that. Angelina is quite an interesting artist, so I'm going to tell you about her, but I've, I've sort of taken her out of the text. She's, she's a sort of preamble or preface uh, rather than um, the core of what I'm going to talk about as she was. If I can go back, so that, that, that was what happens when you do it on the morning of the talk. <laughs> if I go back to this, I mean, does, do, do people know what this is? Are you familiar with this? Yeah, it's, it's, it's well, yes, I mean, it's a pastor advert. <laughs> it's actually an illustration for quite a famous text by Roland Barthes, the French... Uh, uh, linguistic philosopher. Um, for Panzani, advert, uh, a pastor and pastor sources, which uh, appears in a book called uh, Music Image Text uh, for an essay called The Rhetoric of the Image. And it's an image and a text that we studied ad infinitum at university because it was seen very much as the way to understand all visual images, particularly art images, but, as you can see, applied by Barthes himself, to an advertisement. And what Barthes says about an advertisement like this, but also all images, is that there are three messages that come from an image like this. There is the denotive message, there is the connotive message, and there is this mysterious thing called mise en abîme. And the denotive message 
is literally what you see, a tomato that looks like a tomato, um, a, a pasta that looks like pasta, and so forth. The connotive message is very simple as well. What does it equal? Well, you know, the pasta is sort of a bit like the white of the, the Italian flag. There's green on the pasta thing, and there is the red of the tomato. So those colors together indicate the Italian flag without actually showing it. So it connotes Italian values of Italian culture, even though Panzani is actually a French pasta brand. <laughs> and then you have this strange thing, mise en abeam, which I'm not going to mention now, because, um, I will mention it later, but I'm not going to mention it now, because for most people who study arts, or study art, and end up encountering arts, they tend to ignore mise en abeam, because it's a bit difficult. The denotive message and the connotive message is very simple to understand. It's almost a sort of symbolism, really. But essentially, it's what we call structuralism, or used to call structuralism. It's the structures, the linguistic structures, that make the world work, that make the world understandable, and make images have meaning. So we learnt all of this at university. We'll go to the next slide which is in the right order now, so that's fine. Well, the problem that Angelina had at university in Wales, at Aberystwyth, was that people kept reading that type of meaning, denotive and connotive, into her photographs. And the problem she had with that was that the photographs we see are not the works of art. The works of art or the aesthetic experience, perhaps we should say, was her experiencing the raw environment in a very direct way on her body. So the photograph was intended as a sort of record of that, but it was an inadequate record, as far as she was concerned, for two reasons. The first is it did not make anybody feel the raw environment in the way she felt it. But the worst thing, and, and the thing that really upset her, was that they kept looking at these images. There's another one I have on the slide. And instead of reading it as a celebration of human freedom in the natural environment, or even in the urban environment, there are some urban scenes as well, instead of that, people kept reading it as signifying, in a Roland Barthes sense, the degradation of the female body as if these were somehow murder scenes in the forests or in the city. And she didn't want that at all. So what she did in the end was dispense with the photographs and instead took large groups, well, reasonably large groups of people to go and do what she did, have an aesthetic experience, a naturist experience in the woods or in the city, which is an interesting solution. But... Perhaps it's not a solution, because one of the things that we are going to hear about in this talk is the question whether anything that happens in our world, in our reality, such as going out and experience raw nature in a very direct way, is really art. Maybe that's experience of our world. Maybe art is actually something else and something that steps outside of our world, something that, to use a sort of religious term, transcends our world. So you know, for several years, I've sort of been sticking in Angelina's slides into my talk. And it was only when Ad and Esther and others were questioning whether this is appropriate, because it doesn't seem to fit in with what I'm, I'm actually saying. But I actually stopped and think, thought, yeah, actually, there is something in that. It's an interesting thing, I think, an interesting problem she raises. And it is the problem that we have with Barthes, that I have with Barthes. But maybe her solution is not my solution. Maybe it's, it's unique to her, and that um, has to be kept as unique to her, and you know, maybe we have a talk about Angelina's work rather than uh, my work in, uh, in, in that context. Let's look at the next slide. 
Okay, well, something very different now. Well, I mentioned there the notion of our world, alternative worlds, transcendence. And it's certainly not uncommon to hear people talk of realities. And I do mean their realities in the plural rather than reality in the single or the singular. But that word in English has undergone significant modification in recent decades. In the past, it indicated the modules that comprise a singular reality. So we would, in, in, you know, in times past, we would talk about the realities of a situation. So the situation remains singular, but it has realities that lead to that singular situation. But now it seems to indicate several distinct alternative realities. Now, to some extent, that is the result of the popularization of phenomenological thinking, in which reality is personalized to an individual or subjective opinion, rather than the shared empirical situation. So the idea that we all share a reality has somehow been um, um, displaced, uh, and we have subjective realities of our own. I think that's quite problematic in a political sense. Uh, it suggests a sort of privatization of experience, but that's another, another issue we could go into. In literary theory, this is known as reader response. The reader response to reality, the reader response to literature, the reader response to art. But the notion that there are alternative realities and not just one reality, also has its roots in popular science fiction, where the notion is often posited now in films like Star Trek or television programs like Star Trek, that different realities exist, and that even travel between different realities is possible through wormholes in the fabric of space. So hence my image from Star Trek of one of the enterprises going through a wormhole, I presume. Um, rather than just a cloudy day. Science, science fiction, philosophy, they all seem to have a place in the discussion of realities. Art, on the other hand, is rarely mentioned in relation to the establishment of realities. I think that's both a mistake and very telling of how we treat art. I think what it indicates is that the discourse, the language, the debate around art, instead of taking part in these massive shifts in culture, so we no longer believe in a singular reality, but we believe in realities, that discourse is not unique to art. Therefore, we don't really need art's input into that. We can just use the literary discourse. And a lot of art theory now, and really for the last 20, 30 years or more, is literary theory that has been reapplied to art. So we don't really need a theory of art to talk about distinct realities. But this wasn't always the case. In the 1950s, the English art theorist Herbert Reed suggested in books such as The Forms of Things Unknown, Icon and Idea, and The Art of Sculpture, that without art, there would be no human consciousness. Without human consciousness, there would be no comprehension of reality, and without a comprehension of reality, there would, in effect, be no reality. There might be existence, but without consciousness to verify or at least hypothesize existence, even that cannot be guaranteed. And he wasn't alone in putting forward this version of idealist philosophy. Before him, in the second half of the 19th century, the, cult uh, the art theorist Conrad Fiedler suggested that and I quote, artistic activity begins when human art, humankind, driven by inner necessity, grasps with, it, with the power of its mind the entangled multi multiplicity of appearance and develops it into a configured visual existence. In other words, what he's saying there is that reality as we understand it as a coherent and unified experience of the world is created through artistic activity. But in truth, art has dealt with alternative realities for centuries. Next slide. 
For example, in the Greek Orthodox uh, Christian Church, to which I, I nominally belong, I was baptized into it anyway, a painting showing Christ or the Virgin Mary, in this case we've got Christ and the Virgin Mary, or any of a myriad of saints, is not seen as simply a representation or signifier in that Bartian sense of the figure depicted. For Greek Orthodox and Russian Orthodox and Serbian Orthodox and so on, for Greek Orthodox Christians, a painted icon showing the Virgin Mary reveals the actual Virgin Mary to us. And because of that, we shouldn't think of the icon as just a picture. We should think of it more as a magical, reality, a magical window between our reality, the reality of humankind, and the reality of the divine sphere, or perhaps we would call it heaven. Indeed, the German theologian Ernst Benst, Benst has called the Greek Orthodox icon a celestial window between heaven and earth. And so I think it's not too far-fetched to conceive of the icon, an icon showing the Virgin Mary, as being almost like a wormhole in a science fiction film. It somehow connects two distinct realities, the reality of our world, the reality of its world. Well, that's quite an astonishing statement for the orthodox painters to make. We need to acknowledge, we need to understand that they are making an assertion that this is a reality as real as our reality, yeah? not some hypothesized intellectual reality, maybe like Platonism. It is a reality. It is a thing in itself, for itself. But that's a thing that's got the potential to cause very great confusion, particularly in the West. Because in the West, when we talk about icons, we almost mean the opposite of reality. If we have the next slide. I just threw this one in because the way the space is organized in the painting, it sort of gives the message of, of different distinct realities. You've got um, Earth there with the, uh, um, this is Ivan the Terrible leading uh, um, you know, the soldiers on a sort of crusade. And then you've got Heaven up uh, the heaven, the, um, the city of God up there, and you've got St. Uh, Michael appearing in another space. So it's almost like bubbles of space opening up, alternative realities, and they are almost like wormholes. They're almost like the, the Star Trek thing in a way, and it's sort of, I, I know it's a silly connection, but I, I sort of like it, but um, uh, it sort of makes a point. Uh, if you do the next slide. In the West, we tend to see icon as the opposite of reality. When we look at perhaps an image of Marilyn Monroe, a very familiar image of Marilyn Monroe, or Lady Diana perhaps, or um, now the, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, uh, Kate Middleton, and we talk about it being iconic, we mean the representation. We do not mean generally the reality. For Greek Orthodox Christians, on the other hand, it's the icon that's real. So the reality which the Virgin Mary inhabits is a reality that is brought before us, not a fantasy that's brought before us. I think the second thing I'd suggest we take note of in that Greek Orthodox tradition is that the alternative reality of the icon, which, as I've said, could be heaven, it could be a spiritual world, it's certainly an alternative world, is an unknown now, that seems like a ridiculous thing to say in itself. How can it be unknown? We've just seen the Virgin Mary. That's not unknown. It's a figure. It's a human figure. It seems to be a female figure. Well, the icon is not seen simply as the visualization of the alternative reality. Because the alternative reality is unknowable. It's so outside of our comprehension. How could we unknow it? We only get glimpses of it. The artist grabs form from it and makes that visible. But the notion of the whole form, 
the notion of the whole reality remains in what the Orthodox call the divine darkness. That's an important phrase, I think, divine darkness, because the unknown other reality, the divine darkness, the heaven, the spiritual world, and our world come together in the icon. That point at which they meet is known to orthodoxy as the point of hypostasis. It's a sort of intertidal zone between two opposing and different realities. But what I think is quite significant about that, what I think is very significant about that for artists, is that this is not realized through a rejection of materiality. It's realized through physical means. And again, this tallies with the thinking of Herbert Reed and Conrad Fiedler. And again, it seems something that's counterintuitive, at least in the West. We tend to assume that spirituality, spiritual realities, if we believe in such things anyway, are manifested through the rejection of material and physical objects. Materialism is often characterized as the opposite of spiritualism. Like reality and image, in the West, matter and spirit are often presented as opposites. And it's this almost Gnostic antipathy towards the material world that is manifest not only in this opposition of spiritualism and materialism, but in the academic humanities. In the humanities, in academia, immaterial thought is more often than not considered superior to manual work and labor. The laborer is considered inferior to the brain worker, the laborer or artisan, the laborer um, or artist is not considered as significant as the thinker, the philosopher, the literary critic. And we see that actually in everyday life. I was thinking about this the other day. The factory worker, the physical activity of factory work is not as significant in our societies, I'm sure it's the same here as anywhere else, as the banker who just sits doing immaterial things at a computer screen. So even in everyday life, the material and the spiritual or the immaterial are considered oppositional. But in the orthodox tradition, of course, that division does not exist. And it doesn't exist to the point where if you make that claim, you are considered a heretic. You cannot reject the physical and reach the spiritual. There were civil wars in the early Christian church in the East uh, fought over this, and people literally died over whether you could do that. But I, I, I want to think about that for a moment because that seems to me an extraordinary statement. For Orthodox Christians, the paintings in a church are not decoration. They're not there to teach the congregation stories from the Bible. Instead, they are there as part of the Eucharist. Next slide, please. Like the Eucharist, the Holy Communion, the painting is seen as something that's transformed into something else. So, in the Eucharist, in the Holy Communion, the bread and the wine are transformed into the um, body and blood of Christ. And I think that's so at odds with mainstream Western thinking that it takes a moment to come to terms with. For the Orthodox, the bread and wine are not signifiers of the body and blood of Christ in the way that Barthes would have us believe. They are the body and blood of Christ. Well, that's something that the Orthodox share with Roman Catholics, of course. But for the Orthodox, it goes one step further. Next slide. A painted icon is not the signifier of Christ or the Virgin or the saints. It is Christ, the Virgin Mary, or the saints. The depiction of the painting is, in other words, a reality and not a representation. Again, it is a thing in itself, not a representation of something else. Well, that requires an astonishing leap of faith to accept. And maybe it's an astonishing leap of faith that people will not readily adhere to. 
But I don't think it's a Christian leap of faith. I think it's an artistic leap of faith. I think the notion that the artwork transcends its material reality through engagement with its material nature is something that's essential to art. Now, in the past, I've tended to call this, suspen- uh, this leap of faith a suspension of disbelief, but I, I'm, I'm increasingly liking the word faith. Faith, not in a religious sense, but faith as an absolute belief. And that raises what I consider an interesting question about art. What if we take this basic theory, this orthodox theory, and we don't apply it to orthodox art, paintings being made now, this is a modern icon. What if we reapply it to mainstream art now, or at least some art in the world now that would be considered contemporary art? What if we apply it to the work in this, gal- in this, this room? What if a painting, or even a three-dimensional art object like a sculpture, is not seen as a decorative art item, or a signifier of narrative, of meaning? What if instead it's seen as a reality? It would be an alternative reality to our own, of course. We can tell that by the fact it doesn't look like our reality. But what are the implications for willfully applying this notion of art and reality to Western art now? What would we say is the function of art in that context? art that is an alternative reality. In the Orthodox Christian Church, the answer to that question is very easy to give. In Orthodox Orthodox Christian art, the answer to that question is that the artwork, the painting, is a Eucharistic object, an object that's in a state of hypostasis between the spiritual reality and our reality. So it's rather like Holy Communion. It is there to save your soul. So are we saying, or am I saying, that in applying the same basic theory to secular art in the West, the function of art would also to be, be to save the human soul, to heal a broken human existence? Well, that's their questions, as I'd rightly said, I'm raising questions. But I think they're important questions because... If we don't answer them, and we don't address them in the way that I think adequately answers them, I'm not sure art has any function in society. If art is just going to be decoration and just going to signify that which already exists, I'm not sure we need art at all, which means I'm not sure we need artists at all. Surely there must be something more than just providing decoration, um, whatever the context. Well, the idea of art being a link between our reality and an alternative reality is not restricted to Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But every time you encounter it, surprisingly common is the idea that physicality is important to this connection. The linking of things deeply spiritual and otherworldly with things material and decidedly worldly is there in pre-Christian pagan art, for example. No, this is not pre-Christian pagan art. This is um, Burne Jones's um, series, one of the, um, um, the Pygmalion series in Birmingham City Art Gallery in England. And what you're seeing is Pygmalion and Galatea. Now, the Greek myth of Pygmalion and Galatea as retold by the Roman writer Ovid, tells of a sculptor in Cyprus called Pygmalion, who carves a statue of a woman. And the statue is so beautiful that Pygmalion falls in love with it. And so he prays to the goddess Aphrodite to have a wife just like the statue. Well, one day his prayers are answered, and he returns to his workshop, and he discovers the statue has come to life. The now living statue is named Galatea. Galatea means milky, milky white. And unusually for Ovid, she and Pygmalion live happily ever after. 
But I want you to listen to Ovid describe the longing Pygmalion has for his sculpture. Often he ran his hands over the work, feeling to see whether it was flesh or ivory, and would not yet admit that ivory was all it was. He kissed the statue and imagined that it kissed him back, spoke to it and embraced it, and thought he felt his fingers sink into the limbs he touched, so that he was afraid lest a bruise appear where he had pressed the flesh. Remember, that's when it's still a statue. It's not a body, a human body. Um, I should point out that it depends. You know, Ovid is writing about a, a, a marble, sta- um, uh, an ivory statue, but the, um, uh, the, if you like, the non-Ovid versions tend to talk about a stone statue. So it's one of those things that has uh, several versions. Well, when Aphrodite grants Pygmalion the wish and his sculpture comes to life, so the it becomes a she, Pygmalion still can't stop touching her. When Pygmalion returned home, he made straight for the statue of the girl he loved, leaned over the couch and kissed her. She seemed warm. He laid his lips on hers again and touched her breast with his hands. At his touch, the ivory lost its hardness and grew soft. His fingers made an imprint on the yielding surface, just as the wax of Hymettus melts in the sun, worked by men's fingers, and is fashioned into many different shapes and made fit for use by being used. The lover stood, amazed, afraid of being mistaken, his joy tempered with doubt, and again and again he stroked the object of his prayers. It was indeed a human body. The veins throbbed as he pressed them with his hands." Now, as this suggests, in Ovid's version of the story, which appears in the collection Metamorphosis, despite the spiritual or magical intervention of the goddess, things are extremely physical right from the outset. And this is because Ovid's Pygmalion and Galatea is very much the story of the physicality of art. And it's clear that Ovid doesn't make a distinction between the spiritual act of vivifying the sculpture and the physical act of touching it. Let's have the next slide. Okay, so you've got Aphrodite appearing um, and bringing the sculpture to life. And then the next slide. And then Pygmalion returns and can't stop touching her even now. Now, of course, this kind of thing might be too difficult for modern sensibilities. The idea that sculpture can come alive, or that a painted Madonna is really the Madonna, that might be too difficult for us to believe, because of how sensible and rational we are in the West not to believe in such things. But what if we choose for a moment to believe in such things, to have faith in them? What if we take control of our faculties and choose to believe, rather than accepting the logic that is imposed on us that such things are impossible? What if we posit the impossible, imagine the unimaginable. Where would that act, not of losing control and becoming irrational, but taking control of one's own rationality lead us? Well, to explain that story, uh, to explain what I mean, let's have another story, a parable, one of my own. Next slide, please. And this will explain the uh, strange shirts that some people are wearing in the audience. I want you to imagine we're on a bus. The bus driver is taking us to where the bus company says we must go. And no amount of protest or reason from the passengers will persuade him to deviate from the bus company's route. In fact, if we passengers complain too much, the driver pulls a gun on us and orders us to sit down. Occasionally, He even shoots some of the passengers, so we know he means it. Welcome aboard Capital Buses. In the neighbouring town... What what is the neighbouring town to grinning at it? Amsterdam? (laughs) In the neighbouring town, they run their buses differently. On vanguard buses, a proletarian committee, set up by some of the more vocal passengers, decides on the destination of the bus this time acting in the best interests of all the passengers. Of course, some of the passengers still disagree with the destination, 
but they are either locked in the boot or they're shot, but this time for their own good. A little further away, I've heard of the town of Liberty, and there they have a bus company called Freedom Buses. And with Freedom Buses, everyone has their own bus. They can drive it wherever they want, and they can even customize it if they want to. Freedom Buses has the slogan, Freedom is the way to liberty. But what if we don't want to be on the bus? What if we say, to hell with buses, stop the bus, I want to get off. But how is it possible to get off the bus, asks Capital Buses and Vanguard Buses and Freedom Buses. There is only the bus. Well, perhaps the rider to this parable is the question, why do you want to get off the bus? Well, for many Christians, anarchists, and I'd suggest many artists, getting off the bus, the bus of culture, and seeing what's outside the bus, what is outside known culture, has long been very important. Getting off the bus and facing the divine darkness. Culture, we know, is an existing reality. It's that which is already known. So whatever lies in the divine darkness outside of culture is unknown, undefined, waiting to be brought into existence. Inside the bus, we find the forms of things well known. Outside it, we find the forms of things unknown. But how is it possible to get off the bus? as capital buses and vanguard buses and freedom buses. There is only the bus. Well, next slide. Before anarchism was properly named and effectively defined, a French proto-anarchist called Charles Fourier, writing in the early years of the 19th century, tried to imagine what a world would be like following a social revolution. In other words, he tried to imagine what it would be like if we got off the bus. Well, following a social revolution, Fourier suggested, not only would political relationships change, but the nature of reality would change. That is one of the most difficult concepts to understand in political circles the concept in utopian politics that we don't just change politics, we change reality. We assume that reality is a permanent feature, so the notion that reality might change is very difficult to grasp. How could, say, an oak tree be different just because we live in a socialist country rather than a capitalist one? Surely an oak tree is always an oak tree because its existence is fixed. And even radical political activists struggle with this, which is why so much political activism is really rather dull. Many political activists lack the imagination for true revolutionary thought. It really is a pedestrian kind of revolution that thinks only of replacing one set of government bean counters with another set of government bean counters. But it's a revolutionary hero of another kind who thinks like Fourier. Fourier wanted a revolution that would not just change the government, it would change reality. So that, for example, he said, in a post-revolutionary utopia, and I did notice there is a project going on at the Minerva Academy which seems to be talking about real utopia, so maybe this is something you need to bring into that. He suggested that in post-revolutionary utopia, lions and sharks would cease to be dangerous meat-eating monsters, and turn instead into ve vegetarian anti-lions and anti-sharks. Similarly, the salty sea would cease to be poisonous to drink and would be transformed into lemonade. Well, that sounds mad. But it's the point about alternative realities. They're not like our own reality. They appear like fantasy, like magic, like madness. They transform our reality as dramatically as turning bread and wine into human flesh and blood. So perhaps Fourier didn't mean or believe that lions and sharks would become anti-lions and anti-sharks and the sea would turn to lemonade, but perhaps he did. 
Perhaps the faith of Furia was so strong, he believed, he suspended his disbelief. No one really knows, to be honest. But however, even if he was wrong on the specifics, the point we should take from that is that the nature of a revolutionary world is surely that it should be revolutionarily different to a non-revolutionary world. It's not just like our world, but with a new management in charge. And of course, it's not difficult to see parallels between Fourier's vision of utopia and the utopia of the Garden of Eden. But in saying that, we have to acknowledge that Eden is also not simply a place on Earth. It's a locked space, separate from our space. In fact, in the Kabbalistic tradition, it's not even necessarily thought of as being on Earth or having existed on Earth. It's, 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 it's so separate. Either way, we should conceptualize Eden as a locked reality. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, 24, that Eden is guarded by a terrifying angel, a cherubim, with a face that looks in all directions and who guards the entrance to Eden with a sword of fire. It's in this division between two states, two realities, that I believe we find the, na the question, what is the nature of art? We seem to have here a notion that the known world, the world of human culture, is set against the unknown world, the unknown, perhaps non-human culture, or non-human existence, we shouldn't say culture. So the question is, as an artist, do you attempt to visualize the known world, culture, or the unknown world, the forms in the divine darkness? In the case of the novelist Emile Zola, the answer was very clear. Despite the insistently mod, uh, insistent modernity and realism of his novels, Zola was adamant that he was not holding a mirror up to society, not holding a mirror up to culture. To do so would not be to create art. My art, wrote Zola, is a negation of society, an affirmation of the individual, independent of all rules and all social obligations. And then he added a really telling phrase in light of what I just said, we artists are in heaven and we're not coming down. The rejection of culture next slide, also informed the work of the British sculptor Eric Gill, a known anarchist. This is on the BBC headquarters in London. It's Ariel and Prospero. Gill wrote, culture is dope. It's a worse dope than religion. For even if it were true that religion is the opiate of the people, it's far worse to poison yourself with culture than being poisoned. To hell with culture. Culture is a thing added like sauce to stale fish. To hell with culture, says Gill. Well, that phrase became the title of an essay by Herbert Reed in 1943, and then the title of his book, To Hell with Culture, in 1963. And in direct homage to Reed in, in 2005, two more anarchist writers, uh, Gustav Klaus and Stephen Knight. Um, oh, you've got the next slide, sorry. <laughs> yes, there we go. Use the title again, um, To Hell with Culture. Well, what a long life for a simple phrase, to hell with culture, to hell with culture, to hell with buses. Like Go Zola, Gill and Reed suggest rejecting culture with its known parameters, is necessary to realize art with its unknown mysteries. Now, with all of this, I'm not trying to persuade you to go to church and repent your sins, although I do feel like I'm an old-time preacher up on the <laughs> pulpit. I'm certainly not threatening you with fire and brimstone. But what I am trying to suggest is that there is, if there is, um, that the notion that there is only a predetermined structure to reality, which we might call culture, or we might call a bus, is not the only way, only way to conceptualize existence. The belief in an inescapable predetermined structure is an ideology, one that has its roots in Marxist cultural studies. And because of it is an ideology, 
It's little more than a belief system. And it's because it's a belief system, we do not have to believe in it. But I admit, it's a very widespread belief system. Now, Marxist art history is, of course, a legitimate way to study art. And it forms an approach that, or methodology, that can be used by anyone. Indeed, its use so wide, its use is so widespread now that its Marxist origins are often no longer recognized, remembered, or acknowledged. The idea that we're trapped on the bus, that we're wholly within culture, that there is nothing outside of culture, which was once a radical Marxist statement on the nature of, of being, of existence, and therefore of art, is now the mainstream. It's now so normal, so safe, that it can even be studied by would-be princesses. For example, Kate Middleton, the future queen of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, studied a Marxist form of art history at the University of, of, uh, of Stirling, all without raising an eyebrow. So for all its claim in the last century to be radical and revolutionary, this approach to art is in fact deeply conservative. It's conservative because it's become mainstream, but it's also conservative because it says we are trapped. We're trapped in a framework. We're stuck on the bus. We're stuck in culture. Well, you might think that none of this really matters, but there really are serious implications that stem from the idea that we are trapped. Next slide. It was the English philosopher Thomas Ernest Hume, writing before the First World War, who summed up the problem, the position, I suppose. According to Hume, there are two types of people in the world. There are those who consider human nature to be like a well, mysterious and perhaps infinitely deep, full of possibilities. And there are those who consider human nature to be like a bucket, which is to say fixed, finite and limited. The idea we're wholly and inescapably within culture is to see human nature as being like a bucket. So if you think none of this matters, then what you're actually saying is that it's all right to be trapped in a bucket. And that's your right to think that. But let's think about it another way, again with another story. Two children are playing on the beach. One of them sits holding his bucket in his hands. The wide open beach with its golden sands and rock pools, the candy floss cellar and the Punch and Judy show are all unknown to this little boy because all he does all day is stare into his bucket hoping something interesting will appear in it. And because nothing ever does appear in it, he becomes miserable, sad and bitter. The other child doesn't have a bucket. Instead, she runs up and down the beach all day, digging up things from the stand, finding strange creatures in the rock pools, eating candy floss, and laughing at the Punch and Judy show. Her world is infinitely varied, and she's filled with the joy of life. So which would you rather be? The boy with the bucket, or the girl running up and down the beach? And I suppose we should degender that. The girl running up and down the beach, the boy running up and down the beach, the boy with the bucket, the girl with the bucket. Well, I attended a university art department at the University of Leeds in England that was overtly and unashamedly Marxist. That's something that seems very strange, I think, to students and others perhaps now. The idea that a university department could have an overt and publicized political view. But from the 1960s, late 1960s until the 1990s, it was relatively common, at least in Britain. So at Leeds, we were taught that human nature is defined by human culture, that, it's formed, uh, that this forms reality for human beings, and there is no escape from the, this reality. We are in the bucket, or looking in the bucket, perhaps. All we can try to do, as artists and as critics, is try to understand that reality. No one ever quite said, rather like Dr. Pangloss in Candide, this is the best of all possible worlds. But the implication was that this is the only possible world. 
And that always struck me as rather a strange attitude for people who claim to be radical. How can you actually claim revolution if you don't believe in fundamental change, was my approach and my understanding. But what really bothered me was the debilitating effect it had on the fine arts students in the studios. It undercut the very motivation for most of them, that most of them had, for wanting to become artists in the first place, namely to be creative. It said there is no such thing as creativity, there is only reflectivity, by which I mean the artist cannot create or envisage utopias outside of culture in the way, for example, anarchists like Herbert Reed suggested, all they can do is rearrange the signifiers of existing cultures in different ways, or culture in different ways, or we might say all they could do is reflect culture in a Bartzian sense, hence crea not creative, reflective. Well, the logic behind this was clear. To create meant to see beyond known culture, but there was no beyond culture. We were stuck on the bus. Next slide, please. Evidence of how debilitating this was for supposed studio practice art students became graphically clear a few years after I had left the university when the fine art students staged two events that caused a bit of a media storm in England. The first was in 1998 when the students obtained a financial grant for their end-of-year show, and then leaked a story to the newspapers that suggested they'd actually spent the money on a holiday in Spain. The story was false, of course, but it was widely reported in the newspapers and on television and on the radio. And then that reportage, the, the fuss, was presented by the students as their work for their final show. The second event was in 1999 when the same students decided not to show any of their own work, but to exhibit work by other artists. Now, it's important to recognize that this was not a degree course in curatorial studies. It was, of course, a course which, even in a Marxist art department, claimed to be designed to encourage students to understand and produce art. So staging a show by other people's, of other people's work was really a conceptual statement that suggested the making of art, in other words, creativity, was not really possible. Indeed, the students admitted as much. One of them, John Crosley, told the Times Higher Education Supplement, this art course is a very loose one with no real criteria. So far, so good, we might think. That's its strength, he said. The tutors don't tell you what to do, but they still assess your work, your practical product, and in a way, this has immobilized us into producing nothing. That's a very nihilistic statement, and I'm not sure I can really accept the joy of Mr. Crosley at having been immobilized by a course. But at least there was honesty in what he was saying was his and other students' situation. They were immobilized on the bus. They'd been ordered to sit down, as far as I was concerned, at gunpoint, and they did. But it's not just with art students we see this. Big names in the art world are also immobilized and trapped on the bus. At the moment, in, the London, in London, at the Whitechapel Art Gallery, there's a large retrospective of the work by the British artist Sarah Lucas. As one would expect, it includes Lucas's trademark self-portrait, such as this, Fighting Fire with Fire, and several of the food nudes most notably two fried eggs and a kebab, comprising a kitchen table on which eggs and a kebab are set to look like breasts and a vagina. As well as breasts and vaginas, um, the room is also full of penises, and ma uh, mechanical masturbating hands while waving helplessly in the air in search of penises, and so on. But this phallocile obsession becomes more evident in the second section of the show, located upstairs, where penises, both large and small, have been modelled in and cast in plaster and bronze. Now, if you like jokes about breasts and vaginas and penises, you'll probably find it quite amusing, at least for a little while. But it does start to pall. Not simply because jokes about breasts and vaginas and pe pe penises become a little repetitive, 
and as we all know, a joke told too often ceases to be funny, but because Lucas is emblematic of a far sadder story of artists in the late 20th century, in which the key theme is loss and disillusion. Looking at Sarah Lucas's work, you are constantly reminded of something else. The chairs on which pairs of stuffed tights have been tied look a bit like an Eva Hesse. The mobiles, next slide, look a bit like Alexander Calder's. The endless toilets remind you of Marcel Duchamp and even the giant penises, next slide, upstairs look like an attempt to do a Henry Moore. And you can go on with the reference spotting. It's, it's, it's a sort of deliberate thing. But the point is that Lucas, like many artists of her generation, lost faith in art, by which may, me, I mean she lost faith in the claim that art can be creative. For that generation, originality, creativity, and even personal identity in art looked like false goals. So the only thing left for an artist like Lucas to do was become a kind of tyro. Now, a tyro in English cultural theory is... Um, well, originally it was a, a sort of uh, a youth who has confidence but not knowledge. But under Wyndham Lewis, before the and during the First World War, in a novel called Tyro, it became not just a youth with confidence and no knowledge, but also an arrogant uh, and sneering figure. He painted a picture of a Tyro, which is the next slide. There we go, self-portrait as Tyro. So the Tyro sneers, debases, is nihilistic. And so what I'm suggesting here is that Lucas and many of her generation are like Tyros. They're like the miserable, sad and bitter boy on the beach staring into the bucket. Lucas longs to be, next slide, like the artists of the 1950s and 60s who believed art could transcend the bucket of culture. And she even depicts herself as if she's one of them. But she has no faith in that vision of art that they had. And so all she can do is mock and sneer and debase. She cannot be truly creative because she does not believe in creativity. When it comes to her art, she really does appear to be an embittered nihilist. Well, the shocking thing about nihilism is how easily it plays into the hands of some of the most corrupting influences on society. It's notable, I think, that Lucas's show, for all its grunge, all its supposed radicalism, is, is sponsored by Louis Vuitton. The exhibition is, in effect, a glorification of fashionable grunge. Now, even more than Tracy Emin or Damien Hirst, Lucas has, in effect, given wealthy collectors like Louis Vuitton, Charles Saatchi, Lord Rothschild, the frisson of brushing with the dangers of bohemian poverty without really having to experience it. In this, her work panders to a, a, a kind of rich man's voyeurism. And it's, a, it's exemplified in the Whitechapel show, I think, by a succession of dirty toilets and soiled mattresses, all of which are undoubtedly far more squalid than anything, for example, that Tracy Emin has ever presented. But in the context of the plush interiors of the Whitechapel Art Gallery, it's very much... It doesn't ring true. It does feel, feel rather like um, the... Um, 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 well, I, I suppose the analogy I would use is something rather like Marie Antoinette when she used to have a few peasants in the grounds of Versailles. Well, they're sort of decorative peasants in the ground of Versailles. They're not really uh, there to, to, to give any sense of what, um, uh, what, what uh, it's like to be a peasant. So Lucas might appear to give us radical art, comprising radical signifiers of society, but those signifiers are, I believe, misleading. I think she's actually a deeply conservative artist whose work and persona as an artist panders to the fantasies of the rich. 
But I've called this talk Reviving the Corpse of Art. So how do we revive the corpse of art? I suppose the starting point has to be to acknowledge that there is a corpse, that we are dealing with something that's dead. But equally, we have to acknowledge that that corpse is a kind of murder victim. For that reason, the murderers of art, the Vuittons, the Suches, the Rothschilds of this world, have nothing to contribute to the question of reviving the corpse. Instead, those people should be imprisoned for their crimes against humanity. Nor should mainstream artists whose belief system is nihilistic be involved. I think we can feel sorry for them, pity them, but we can't include them because nihilism is always a form of death and death cannot bring a corpse to life. So my starting point is not in the existing mainstream art world. It's outside of that. It's in the margins. It's in orthodox of icon painting, for example. It's in anarchist aesthetics, for example. And it's there in a belief that is not accepted by the mainstream, that art is tied to realities, establishing realities, and that it is a material reality at that. It's not in those who believe that art is a disembodied concept or an act of sophistry. Art, in the margins, is material and real. But it's also transcendent. So when we look at... Let me just get on to the next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Vuitton, I missed that one out. Let me. <laughs> that's not the exhibition, by the way. That's, uh, it's just a Vuitton store. I mean. <laughs> nice glitziness. Uh, let's carry on with our slides. There we go. We see some soiled mattresses from the show. So it's when I'm fielding two pieces of paper, I need them out. Okay, and next. Okay, that's good. Okay, so, it's physical and it's material, but it's also transcendent. Now, that combination has come to be known under a, a label which we did coin, but we sort of coined it again in Ursi as a, as a, as a, almost as a joke, really. The new aesthetics. Aesthetics when I was at university, was a dirty word. You didn't talk about your aesthetics. And so we've coined the new aesthetics. It's a deliberate provocation of those who would deny an, all, an aesthetic, an alternative um, view. That word, or that label, rather, has been applied to artists without my knowledge or our knowledge. It's almost got a life of its own. So every now and again, I've got one of these Google searches set up so that if, if Google comes across the net phrase, the new aesthetics, um, in a, a website or a news story, um, it automatically sends me an email. And it's surprising how often artists you've never heard of, or I've never heard of, suddenly start... Um, calling themselves or being called new aesthetic artists. And what I end up doing is wondering what that means. Because the new aesthetics is a very simple concept, that art is a material product, a material process, an engagement with materials, but at some point it gives up its material nature and leads us into an alternative reality. Now, I don't think that has to be a spiritual alternative reality. I don't think it has to be religious in any sense. The alternative is simply not the mainstream. It's simply not the reiteration of culture. It's somehow transcending that. So, somebody like, uh, I'm not sure I even pronounced this, Christoph 
Yel Yelchis, I, I, I'm, I do apologize um, um, to any Latvians in the, the audience. So I presume it's a Latvian name because he is based in Latvia. Um, the Keys to the Riga, I've never met this artist. I don't know anything about him except he calls himself a new aesthetic artist based on these principles. Well, that's nice. I like the idea. It's almost like Ad and his colleagues inviting me here. How on earth did an artist in Latvia suddenly hear about the new aesthetics. It's got a life of its own. And that means it's getting a resonance. It has a resonance. It, 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 it's saying something, not necessarily to everyone, but it's saying something to a group of artists who I think have been ignored, have been voiceless, perhaps, in the community, the art world. Next slide. Another of his images, uh, the budget fir tree. This is actually made, again, I'm told, uh, from pencil leads stuck onto the, the surface of the paper. I put these in because one of the things that I know I am associated with is realism, and I will come on to that in a moment. But the New Aesthetics is not a realist manifesto. It's not there to explain or justify Realism. When we talk about an alternative reality, we are not talking about a reiteration of this reality. What we're talking about is an alternative. Well, that alternative can look a bit realistic, but it doesn't have to, as in this case. Let's look at the next one. David Dipper, I do know. He lives near me in London. I think he's a very fine artist. And he paints these portraits, which, well don't really fit in with anything that's going on in the mainstream London art world. But I think they are stunning pictures. And they've got another one there. They're not very large. They're sort of blown out of proportion here. They're sort of almost A4, really, I suppose, even smaller, some of them. And next. Arshok Sarkisian is an Armenian artist. This is called Toilet Rolls. So, I mean, I hope you're seeing, you know, there is a lot of diversity that people end up with under this, this label. You don't have to think, well, I don't paint in a realist way. How can I talk about realities? I don't paint like a Greek Orthodox icon painter. How can I talk about the alternative realities and use orthodoxy? It's not a style. It's an approach. It's a belief system. It's also a defense. If you are faced with an onslaught, of conceptualism and that's not what you believe, do you stay silent or do you defend yourself? One of the books, or rather pamphlets, that I published not long after um, the aphorisms of Ursi was called The Tabletop Schools of Art. And the point about The Tabletop Schools of Art is that the title is literal. Instead of having art schools that teach us culture, teach us to ape the mainstream, we have, perhaps, table art schools, where maybe one or two artists get together and discuss the nature of art. There was an artist, a British artist, called Peter de Francia, who came to us in Cyprus, and he said, this place is, is like paradise for an artist. And what it does is it shows you what an art school should be not walls and studios and technicians and offices and libraries and all the paraphernalia that government inspectors tell us we must have in art schools. What Peter de Francia said is that you get four artists under a tree, sitting under a tree, and you've got an art school. So I took that very literally and I said, well, why not four artists in a cafe? Why not four artists having a curry in an Indian restaurant? Why can't that be an art school? Four artists, maybe, will bring together experiences as mature artists, but maybe they'll also bring together art students, would-be artists. Maybe we shouldn't even call them students. Maybe we call them apprentice artists, would-be artists, or less experienced artists who have something to learn from more experienced artists. Well, then you've got a teaching situation. So some of these art schools might even become more formalized, but I like the idea that every artist is also an art school. Perhaps we actually don't say four artists under a tree, we say one artist under a tree 
is an art school. One artist sitting in a cafe is an art school. Why not? Next slide. Oh, yes. Uh, Ryan Hatfield, another artist who gets under this label. This time, an Ala uh, um, this is in As uh, Alaska. He's, he's an American artist. I don't, know if, I don't think he comes from Alaska, but he spent some time. He spent a winter there. As a, he wasn't an artist in residence, he just went there. I don't, don't know why you would just go there, but he did. Yeah. Next slide. Well, what I'm going to end with are two paintings by Clive Head. As I mentioned before, Clive and I work quite closely together, and we have done for a long time. We taught together in England uh, in a university uh, for nearly 10 years. He was head of art, and I was head of art history. And for much of that time, he was associated with photorealism. But the truth is that he rarely made a photorealist painting, at least photorealist painting as set down in the classic definition offered by Louis Meisel, the New York art, art dealer. But when we look at a painting like this, Cof Coffee at the Cottage Light, painted in 2010, which was exhibited in, um, at the National Gallery in London that year, um, it does look a bit photographic. It does look photorealist. But you have to take my word for it, I think, that it's not replicating a photograph. There is no photograph you could take that looks like this. Clive was adamant, even then, that this is an alternative reality. And in 2010, I wrote a book, a very large book on, on Clive, which many people said was too long. <laughs> rather like this talk, maybe, who knows, <laughs> which I said all of this. I said these are alternative realities. The trouble is nobody believed me. I started getting abusive emails. So do Clive, why don't you admit you just take a photograph and copy the photograph? Because he doesn't. Yeah, Lee, you're lying. <laughs> they thought this was a photorealist reflection of reality. It was simple. It was easy to understand. Of course, people liked it because it's obvious what it is. Even a BBC um, art critic who, um, on the main arts program on the BBC Radio 4 uh, channel, Tom Sutcliffe, who also writes for the Independent newspaper, said as much. No one standing in front of Clive Head's painting, he said, Coffee at the Cottage Delight, would waste even two seconds wondering what they're supposed to make of it, what it's about is plain. So, according to Sutcliffe and others, what Clive's paintings are about is plain. There's no mystery, no divine darkness, I suppose. It's just a picture of our world, our reality, our known culture. And as Sutcliffe suggested, why don't Clive's head supporters just admit it? Again, why are we lying? Next slide. Well, to some extent, that experience has led Clive in more recent work. This is a painting that's still ongoing, has no final outcome, to abandon realism in a photographic sense as much as possible. In a sense, he has repainted coffee, coffee at the Cottage Delight, but now he calls it the looking glass. The new version makes it obvious as obvious as a Greek Orthodox icon. And bear in mind, Greek Orthodox icons in the Middle Ages were considered the height of hyper-realism. There are many texts from the Middle Ages astonished at how realistic a Greek Orthodox icon looks. So you know, time changes our perceptions of these. So as much as a Greek Orthodox icon, I think we're obviously not looking at a space in our world. Perhaps we're looking through a celestial window, out of our reality, into somewhere else. Somewhere else where people, such as this figure on the extreme, your left, <laughs> my right, nearest to me, can look in several directions at once, in which people can appear several times. And you can compare them there. It's clearly something that is derived from being in our world, engaging in the reality of our world, the material reality and the space of our world. But what is manifested through the act of painting 
and the open-ended act of painting, not knowing what the outcome will be, is not a reiteration of our world or its ideas or its concepts. It's a unique and one-time only response to that experience. In other words, it has the effect of transcending its source material, of becoming a somewhere else rather than a here. It is stepping off the bus, or at least trying to step off the bus. Maybe we should be qualifying it. Perhaps it's paradise, perhaps it's utopia. We can't know, of course. All we do know is that the painting is no longer a mirror and no longer mistakable as a mirror. It's more like Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass, Alice Through the Looking Glass. It's clearly a bit like our world, but it's not our world. It makes the outside of the bus manifest, outside of culture manifest. And as even Clive admits, the excitement and dynamism that this creates of being freed from the conventions of our world so that space, time, form and colour can operate outside of the conventions of both society and nature in that Fourian sense is extraordinary. Let's go back so we can just make that point. Is extraordinary in comparison to the earlier works. It's as though Clive is no longer looking into the bucket. He's running up and down the beach. He's trying to get off the bus. Perhaps he's got off the bus. And in so doing, he's realizing not form that we know, but forms of things un we, that are unknown. This is the basic theory of the new aesthetics. Next, uh, we have to jump to, that's it. Well, as I say, the new aesthetic seems to be manifesting itself in very different forms, independently of me, in groups, almost like revolutionary cells from Italy and the United States to Britain, Australia, Armenia, who knows where else. Like revolutionary cells, so maybe it's a dangerous theory. It is a dangerous theory. I know so because the lady on the, uh, in the center right, your right, there, Dr. Penelope Curtis, told me that it's a dangerous idea. She is the director of the Tate Britain. I've known Penelope for 20 odd years, so she, she can say things like that to me. <laughs> she, says, she said at um, an exhibition opening in London that perhaps the reason I have no success in having invitations to universities or talk to art students or anything like that is because my ideas are considered too dangerous. Well, I always feel a bit of a fraud with that, because I don't see how this is dangerous. To me, this is what art is. But if a bit of danger appeals to you, then what I'd like to do is invite you as artists, art workers, working in different fields, lovers of art, to consider this theory as a potential way forward for a living art. No, not just a living art a radical and dangerous living art that forces us to face the most terrifying thing in the world, the unknown. I'd like to invite you to get off the bus, to run up and down the beach, because to revive the corpse of art, we need to reanimate it, which I believe means we need to stop looking in the mirror and start entering the mysterious and unknown reality of the looking glass. Thank you very much. I don't know what the time is. But I don't know what the time is, but I'm happy to do questions if you want.